Good afternoon. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Nick, and I'm just so pleased and honored to be here today um, speaking with all of you about a topic that is of vital importance, I think, today on a number of levels. And in my remarks today, I want to highlight um, for you some of the ways in which the discussion about what is framed as a term of art in the law as sacred site, but we might understand it as a sacred land, landscape, or place, in the sense that language invokes people, a spirit, an essence, the English term we use of sight makes us think that there's one specific thing that you can quantify and measure and call sacred. But we're talking about something much more than that in, in the way that we view these connections over time. And that's the intergenerational part of this. So I realize that all of us in this room are situated in different disciplines, histories, narratives, and cultures. And in the remarks that I make to you, I want to frame out the components of the discussion, but really invite an active participatory time with you after the lecture and really engage you on the topic. So thank you so much for being part of this. Um, and thank you to the um, faculty and staff who arranged this um, for Nick, I know you've been planning this a long time. I really appreciate that. And um, it's very, very good to be here. So the issue of sacred sites, a lot of people will distill that into a constitutional law issue of free exercise of religion. Other people will think, well, there's something particular about native people, so we should look at their law, federal Indian law, to see what accommodations must be made for native people with respect to traditional religions. Those are two components of the discussion, but I would argue today that in the broader political context, we are at a very new and different time. Today, more than ever before, federal and state entities and agencies are targeting what are designated as public lands for broad-scale energy development. And that is an enterprise that is intercontinental, it is throughout the Americas, and it implicates indigenous communities in every part of this hemisphere. The people who protest are being designated as terrorists. And there are some of the scariest state laws that I have ever seen being developed to punish people for speaking out, for congregating in protest, and for doing things as simple as being present in the wrong place, i.e. a street, therefore validating violent action against them. There was a report just submitted to the UN uh, Permanent Forum last week that documented the differential prosecution of Native people at the Standing Rock um, campground as opposed to other protesters throughout the nation on different policy issues. So these are patterns that we really have to pay attention to because they uh, threaten some of the fundamental liberties that we all think that we have as American citizens. The other development that I think is worth considering is that I've seen a concerted effort to remove American Indian nations from the policy structures as sovereigns in various commissions, for example, on climate change, and replace them with designees who are then racially sort of excised as why do we need racial participation? Can't everybody just, isn't this a colorblind commission or enterprise? And if we're dealing with state water resources or federal water resources, why do we have to have native people? Or maybe we just have one representative for all native people. And I'm seeing that increasingly in the boards that are being used to um, decide very important issues of what are framed as public resources, but American Indian nations have discrete sovereign rights to those resources. So both of those movements are 
are converging in ways that are very troubling. I think that for all of us as communities that are interconnected in these issues of race and social justice, it is also incumbent upon us to realize how a divide and conquer politics works in this type of a political frame. So alliances, for example, between Latino communities or native communities might be in jeopardy as people start to engage in the different histories and position those in ways that is not a favorable climate for native claims to survive. And I have seen that in the American Southwest with the politics over immigration, for example. So those are things to be mindful of. I, from Stephanie's introduction, it sounded like there would be a speaker um, later on in this term talking about cultural heritage resources. This is a very vital resource. So if we talk about a sacred site, are we talking about a cultural heritage resource? Are we talking about an environmental resource? Or are we talking about energy resources? The language that we use makes a difference. There is a very new case, 2015 case, from the International Criminal Court defining an intentional act that destroyed a cultural heritage site as an act of genocide, cultural genocide against a people. That is a very important aspect of the, the issue right now on public lands. If we are destroying sacred places, if these are intentional actions by the government, does that constitute a form of cultural genocide? In this country, we don't recognize cultural genocide as genocide, but this is the emerging human rights consciousness and frame. So in the talk that I am gonna to give today, I wanna to do four things. First of all, I want to talk about the rights of American Indian nations in their historical context and in the current context so that you'll have an understanding of what some of the legal issues and problems are. Secondly, I want to explore the human rights frame. So as we bring together concepts of law with justice and morality, what does our commitment to sacred places look like in the human rights frame? Third, I want to give you some real concrete current case studies to kind of work this through. And finally, I want to end by looking at themes of the future. And I really appreciate the distinguished panel that is going to follow. These are some of the luminaries working on the ground in the field. And I know that discussion will be very, very rich. So, the legal status of American Indian nations in the United States is oftentimes referred to today in terms of the identity of federally recognized Indian nations with respect to reservation lands and other trust lands. The discussion that I want to engage with you is broader. It is the discussion about the rights of indigenous peoples as peoples to traditional territories, and that is a different discussion. So today, many of the sacred places that belong to American Indian and Alaska Native na nations, as well as Native Hawaiian peoples, are located on lands that are not on the reservation. But they are nonetheless lands that are protected by this intergenerational character, ancestral use and possession, and that is the essence of what the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples refers to as the spiritual rights of indigenous peoples to their traditional territories. So in the Standing Rock case, the Dakota Access Pipeline case, which I think there's a broad consciousness about that, right? Everybody in this room probably heard of that? Yes? Okay. So in that case, and, and I think probably Professor Fletcher got the same number of phone calls, so I remember when it was breaking, and a bunch of reporters called me and said, why does a tribe care if this is off the reservation? Why would they have an interest in those off-reservation lands? And that is probably the most difficult issue with respect to sacred places. So it is that that I want to talk about. So indigenous peoples hold the status of peoples under international human rights law 
2007, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples says indigenous peoples are peoples in the international law sense with the same rights as any other people. And that includes the right of self-determination, which is the autonomy to govern yourself politically under your own laws and to negotiate your political arrangement with the nation state as well as the commitment to cultural survival, cultural integrity, a different cultural essence than the nation states that now encompass indigenous peoples. That is the right that we are framing in this conversation. There are various ways to address that right. And for federally recognized Indian tribes in this country, there is a recognition of sovereign authority of tribal governments to have their own legislative, executive, and judicial structures on their own reservation lands, and then to deal with the United States in a government-to-government -government relationship. And I do have the honor to serve as a tribal court judge, and I can tell you that the tribal courts are incredibly important institutions, but they've also got to negotiate the relationship with the state and federal court systems. And it is that enterprise that really is the essence of what we now call federal Indian law that works out those legal and political arrangements. But think about other ways in which you could effectuate self-determination. And these are all in use in the United States today. There is the self-government model of a federal program. So the federal government puts out a program, health education. The tribe takes over the program and manages it. Those can also be managed by an intertribal organization, health board, for example. I have just recently heard that the federal government is working on a plan to have energy organizations, which are intertribal, to manage tribal resources. And if you think about the politics of that, it takes you away from the government-to-government -government arrangement. And that is something that we also have to take into account in this era. A third one would be co-management. The tribal nation with the ancestral tie to public lands enters a co-management arrangement with federal agencies to manage its areas and its forests. This happens oftentimes when tribal lands are contiguous to the federal public lands. Agua Caliente did that with the Santa Rosa National Forest. Very effective co-management scheme. And a final one is citizen participation, but in a tribal forum. And this is really activated in voting rights, redistricting, for example, to actually make sure that tribal citizens have the right to vote and to t pay attention to issues that affect their children in state schools, roads, public transportation. If we don't have native representation in courts in these various boards, oftentimes the tribal interest gets overlooked. Those are four modes that are used to accomplish self-determination today, but we have to be strategic about how they are operating. So looking at the historical context of the issues, it traces back to time immemorial. So it doesn't trace back to the Europeans. It traces back to time immemorial. And all of the places that my wonderful student, Jacob and Toxin, who, who created this PowerPoint for me, because I don't have the capacity to do that. You should never admit your shortcomings, but I am admitting that one. He actually did these beautiful, beautiful slides and places. So all of these places are the places that belong to indigenous peoples who have been part of those places since time immemorial. And in the very uh, famous um, fishing rights litigation on the Pacific Northwest, one of the leaders um, actually spoke about his nation's um, beliefs there. He says, you know, God created this country. God created this country and he put us, the people there, for the purposes that we we're supposed to be there, stewarding the land, working with the various fish and game on the creator's plan. And that's a, that's a sort of synopsis of what he said. But he said, I, wasn't, I didn't come from a foreign country 
I was put here by the Creator. So the Creator's law was the first law of the land. And when we talk about indigenous traditional law, oftentimes that is the law that we're talking about, an unchanging law, not like the kind of short-term laws of contemporary governments today. So it is that structure that came into uh, the, the, basically, into the commerce with European nations during the colonial era, and then was expressed in an international self-determination view. Nations engage in treaties, and that is the history that we have in this country, that indigenous nations, the Navajo Nation, the Cherokee Nation, were the treaty signatories in all of the treaties with Great Britain and then the United States. So when, when today we talk about the nation-to-nation -nation political relationship, it is a version of international sovereignty that was recognized within federal Indian law. Federal Indian law itself was framed in these three 19th century cases by Chief Justice John Marshall of the United States Supreme Court. And that was the early, early United States Supreme Court. The first case, Johnson v. McIntosh, really tested out the quality of title that American Indian nations had. Could they convey a fee title, the whole title, to these non-Indian speculators during the the years prior to the United States when the colonies were restless, they were buying up Indian land, even though Great Britain reserved the Crown's right to deal with them. They were buying up the land. After the United States came, they said, well, we own the land. That would be true if they bought it from a European government, but they bought it from Indian nations. Marshall said in Johnson v. McIntosh they didn't have that quality of right because the European doctrine of discovery gave that right to the discovering European nation and its grantees, meaning the United States from Great Britain. The Indian people had what the, he said was the right of occupancy. Today we talk about that as aboriginal title. It was recognized, but it's not a compensable interest if the United States takes it. The, the Constitution doesn't protect it. The second one and the third one, Cherokee Nation in Worcester v. Georgia, that was the Cherokee Nation trying to defend its treaty guaranteed territory in Georgia from the incursions of the state who wanted to shut down the Cherokee Nation's governance and basically, you know, take over. And Marshall said American Indian nations are domestic dependent nations. They're not foreign nations, so you can't sue the state directly in the United States Supreme Court. That was Cherokee Nation. But in Worcester, the state tried to apply its criminal laws to non-Indians within the Cherokee Nation who were trying to assist the Cherokee Nation. Marshall said you couldn't do that. They were under the sole and exclusive authority of the federal government and their own law, Cherokee Nation law. The state had no right to be there, couldn't enact its laws. That is still the guiding principle unless the federal government maintains a right to change that. And that is because of the federal government's plenary power. So the duty to protect is called the trust responsibility, but the power to govern indigenous nations is the federal government's plenary power under the US Constitution, which localizes that power in Congress in Article 1, Section 8. They have the sole and exclusive authority to regulate commerce with Indian nations among the several states and with foreign nations. That plenary power in the 19th century turned into Lone Wolf versus Hitchcock, which was basically the wardship. The United States government could abrogate an Indian treaty unilaterally, taking tribal land and basically giving the tribe other services and monies in compensation as its ward. And that is the downside of US federal Indian law, or one of the downsides. Professor Flesher will talk about all the other ones, right? Okay. There are a lot of them. I'm just going to move through the 19th century, but show you some of the main policies in the 19th century that were responsible for divesting Indian nations of their ancestral lands and territories. The Removal Act of 1830, supposedly to get the consent of Indian nations to move westward, where there was a lot of empty land, and leave the east for people who would settle and colonize it. 
I shouldn't say colonization, because the US rejects the notion that it's a colonial nation, but you know what I mean. Reservation and assimilation policies to increasingly downsize the reservations to discrete areas where the US could govern Indians better, um, and then inculcate assimilation policies, can't speak English, boarding school policies, banning religious practice, all of that happened in the 19th century. And amazingly enough, when it was challenged under the First Amendment, they said, well, it's okay, because it's the civilization mission. It's not, it's not the US trying to you know, exercise religious control. They're just trying to civilize. Dawes Allotment Act of 1887, break down the collective land holdings of indigenous nations, give individual Indians little parcels, farms, um, which would eventually be held in fee and release everything else for non-Indian settlement. That is why today a lot of the reservations are in checkerboard ownership, tribal trust land, but also non-Indians holding fee land, but they're on the reservation. This is the pattern of land loss, and you can see 1783, as a result of these policies, that's all tribal land in the blue, shrinks 1831. By 1873, notice in 40 years what happens, 2010. I don't even know if you can see the blue, but here it is. That is what is left in terms of tribal trust land that is protected by tribal government structures within the United States on these reservation lands and trust lands. So just over 56 million acres of tribal trust land. Okay, so what about the sacred places on all the rest of it? Well, American Indian nations today are engaged in nation building within the legacy of many policies that tell Indian nations what that looks like. And again, there's a very complicated politics about this. But the effort has been to restore tribal reservations to their full character and trust lands. But there are many competing forces. And today, the land into trust regulations, for example, of the federal government are out for comment. And again, Professor Fletcher keeps a blog. He's always current. I'm probably not current, so I'm going to let him talk to you about that process. But it is very scary because today, Indian nations have to go through a complex political process to get their land restored into trust. OK, so let's move on and talk about the human rights frame. My students are oftentimes perplexed about where, where justice resides in our system today. We have a legal system, but how is it tied to justice and morality? With respect to sacred places, one of the important lessons is they are repositories of political cultural and spiritual values. All of these histories and competing forces are embedded in that. In the case study of the Black Hills, um, which is, is a very compelling site for the Lakota people, um, it's their creation story, it's their creation site. Um, and it was taken unlawfully by the United States government um, by they had a treaty reservation that protected it, and the United States government took it in 1877 with a process of military brutality without giving them any compensation, gave them rations, and then the rations were sold off. So in 1980, the United States Supreme Court said that was a constitutional taking because that was their treaty guaranteed reservation. But the damages due were 17 million for the value of the land at the date of taking plus interest. At that time it was like 400, 400 million. Today, I don't know what it is, it's still in a trust account, supposedly, if we trust the government, it's still in a trust account because the Lakota people will not take the payment. So the land didn't have a monetary value, the spiritual value was so significant. Now today one of the the most highly 
esteemed places in the Black Hills um, is a site called Bear Butte, where a number of ceremonies are done by Lakota, Dakota, Nakota, and Northern Cheyenne practitioners. And they brought another case to basically challenge the spiritual harms that were accruing because of the state's policy to foster recreational use. And in that case, Crow versus Gullet, the the federal court dismissed the claim as essentially not cognizable under the First Amendment. As long as they had access to the site, as did the rest of South Dakota, they weren't being harmed. They could believe whatever they wanted to believe, and it, it, the government wasn't making them do anything. That is the problem that we have today. If a tribe does not own the land as reservation land, if their political agreement in the treaty is seen as belonging in the past, their spiritual rights, their cultural rights, are often, most often, not protected under the First Amendment Free Exercise Clause because our law differentiates political and legal claims in a way that negates the cultural rights. So, Think about the alternative frames of the law, and this is what I encourage my students to do because the constitutional discussion itself is quite limiting. So the potential domains of law, indigenous law, and here I'm gonna use a shorthand for the traditional law that I talked about, the baseline law of the land that is embedded within the relationship with indigenous people. Domestic federal Indian law, which I've just given you a nutshell about, and then international human rights law. And I want to talk about the possibilities and shortcomings of all of them, but to encourage us to have the discussion that melts what is strong and powerful in each of those as we seek to protect what is sacred. So Indigenous law, the, um, the point that I want to make here is that morality is embedded into the traditional law of indigenous nations. It would be foolish to try to abstract morality from the law and from politics. And somebody who's written very thoughtful work on this is um, Gerald Alfred, um, and he's, um, I, I believe, Mohawk. Um, He's Mohawk, right, or Seneca? I think he's Mohawk. So, but he's written about the, the great law of the Six Nations and the Haudenosaunee Nations. And he basically says in his work, um, Peace, Power, and Righteousness, that that law is aligned, the politics are aligned with the morality of the law in the following sense. He says there's an ethics that pervades. It's power sharing, compromise, and unified purpose. The three parts, peace, righteousness, and power, are interdependent. And he talks about this in the sense of the, of the indigenous word, but I'm just going to turn it into English for this discussion. So the word that means health, if you think of health, wellness, what we aspire to, that, that condition of life, that is soundness of mind and body. He says that term also means the term that equates with peace because that's what comes when minds are sane and bodies are cared for. Righteousness means justice practiced between men and nations, but it also means religion because that is consistent with what the creator ordained at the beginning of time and has his sanction. If you act against that, you destroy the interconnected systems that support life. And so he goes on to talk about how the teachings then translate to everything in the systems of survival that we create as human societies. So that's one version of law and morality within traditional law. How about federal Indian law? Any morality in that? Professor Fletcher looks quizzical. So I guess the problem with federal Indian law is twofold. If you bring yourself under the constitutional structure, you are limited by the constitutional structure. 
But Indian nations aren't part of the Constitution. They didn't agree to be bound by the Constitution. The treaty structure is the constitutional structure between nations. But today, the treaty structure is negotiated in the halls of Congress and in the executive agencies that basically govern all of these lands. And that is a very hard place to be because you're fraught with the political obstacles of any given administration. So when we look and see what's happening today with the Department of Interior, the Bureau of Land Management, the Forest Service, I don't even want to tell you what's going on because it is so chaotic and it's very hard to plan for the future within that political structure. What about international human rights law? What does that add to the equation? And here I would argue that today, in international affairs, there are three kind of modes of discourse happening. There is the mode of discourse that is governed by war and peace. And here we have a Department of Defense that negotiates that in the United States. There is a politics of diplomacy that results in international treaty making. And there we have the Department of State. My understanding from some recently published work is that the Department of State and the Department of Defense are not always in sync on things. So there are tensions there. And the final level is the level of international human rights law. That's the level that cultural heritage discussions are embedded in. So what are the rights of discrete peoples within the international structure? And within a nation state, what are the rights of indigenous peoples, ethnic minorities, religious minorities, women, disabled people? International human rights law is the repository of morality in international law. But I don't know the extent to which it is invoked by the other branches. So I want to return to this discussion of traditional law as I move into the discussion of sacred sites and, and sort of illuminate a trajectory of case law from, let's say, the late 1970s, because that's when the American Indian Religious Freedom Act was basically instilled by Congress to recognize that American Indian and Alaska Native and Native Hawaiian peoples had not been protected by the US Constitution in their religious rights, and that it was the policy of Congress to protect Native religions and Native religious practitioners and basically agencies ought to abide by that. That led to a presidential report. Um, and, and so that, that was kind of the, the essence, that native nations were not protected with the same constitutional standards, and we needed to change that. An early case that came out where the Cherokee people were trying to protect a sacred site was with the Tennessee Valley Authority. And when they put in this dam at Teleco, they flooded the Tennessee River Valley, including a highly sacred place, Teleco, again associated with the Cherokee people's creation story. But there was a very, um, in that whole river valley were a set of places. They had the, an old ancestral town of Shoda. They had burial grounds. They had medicine places where plants grew. They didn't grow anywhere else. It was all in this valley. It was the source of life, according to the Cherokee practitioners that testified. The dam, after 10 years of the Cherokee Nation fighting administratively, was then approved by a writer to an appropriations bill. Congress enacted a big, huge appropriations bill, and then at the 11th hour, they do this quite frequently, at midnight, they attach a little provision that basically obliterates this entire struggle and says to the Tennessee Valley Authority, you can go ahead and condemn all that private land in there and, and build the dam and notwithstanding any federal law. So cultural preservation law, endangered species law, forget it. Just go for it. And in the language of that statute, 
they used a neutral language to describe the Tennessee River Valley as basically um, the dam was the proper use of marginal lands. The sacred law described a place of unbelievable wealth of riches and depth. Congress described it as marginal lands. The Cherokee Nation challenged that under the U.S. Constitution, saying, well, Congress can't, can, they could do a lot of things, but they can't violate the Constitution. This is a violation of our free exercise of religion. And that case in the federal courts was basically, again, not, they didn't win, they lost the claim, because the court said that only, it was, it was a matter of personal preference of some Cherokees to believe that that was a sacred site. Not all Cherokees agreed that, with that. And they could still practice their religion because the site had been out of Cherokee ownership for over 100 years. So if they didn't own it, and what was, the, so end result, that whole valley and the site was flooded. So that sets the stage for what has happened since then. And there have been a variety of attempts to rectify this history. Um, but it, it, in every era, it appears to resurrect itself. So the Ling case, which I put up there, the United States uh, Supreme Court case in 1988, was one where the site was central and indispensable to the tribal religions. Um, and that was in California. Um, there were, um, there, there, this was land under the management authority of the Forest Service. And it was a wilderness area, and they were basically, the Forest Service was trying to connect two timber roads so they could harvest the timber throughout the forest. And so they were going to connect up the 70 mile stretch of road to facilitate timber harvesting. But that exact place, was what the three tribes that were indigenous to that area, um, the Hoopa, Karak, and, and, and Karak, they all said that is the place that is basically like a gateway between worlds. And that place is where you have to have the ceremony that basically was like a renewal ceremony every year. We always use that it must be protected. And it was so dense that non-Indians really didn't go in there. So it was just these practitioners that knew where it was. So the Supreme Court looks at that in the lower court record, the, the anthropological testimony, archeological testimony, everybody agreed that if you put that road in there, it was gonna destroy the native religion. They wouldn't be able to practice. And that's the case that went to the United States Supreme Court. And Justice O'Connor, for the majority of the court, said you don't even have to apply the balancing test that protects in the Constitution when government conduct burdens religion. You don't even have to apply that. Because here the government isn't forcing Indians to do anything or believe anything or give up anything. They're basically just managing public lands and if they want to accommodate Indian practitioners by mitigating some of this, you know, that's fine, but it's not constitutionally required. And Justice O'Connor said to do otherwise would be to put a big religious servitude over lands that belong to the United States and all of the citizens of the United States. That case was very instrumental to changes in the in the um, First Amendment analysis that impacted everybody. So the next case, one um, involving the use of peyote by Native American practitioners of the Native American church, the Smith case, the court again took it one step further and said, well, laws of general applicability, such as criminal prohibitions on drug use, can be applied even if they preclude a practitioner from you know, performing his or her religious um, requirements. And 
The Smith case is what led all of the organized religions in the United States to knock on the door of Congress and say that is basically going to decimate everybody's religion. You have to restore the balancing test when the government burdens religion. And that led to the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which was intended to instill the same type of constitutional protection um, by statute. Now, I know this is probably getting convoluted, so what is the takeaway? The takeaway is that the United States Supreme Court has held that religious freedom is in the order of freedom of conscience. It's the power to believe whatever you want to believe, including that spaghetti is sacred. There actually is a case on this. If you want to believe that spaghetti is sacred, you can believe that, and the government cannot tell you otherwise. But they can basically make their neutral laws, and you may, in fact, be subject to those laws, even if it offends your religion. So the burden that we're talking about now is a very, uh, it's, it's very confined, and it does not support the claims that we are talking about today. And the case that actually stands for that is the Navajo Nation case, and this was about the San Francisco Peaks, highly sacred um, land. The lead plaintiffs in that case, the Navajo Nation and Hopi tribe, but there were, there were other, 14 tribes basically joined that petition saying this was incredibly sacred land, and by manufacturing artificial snow out of sewage effluent and spraying over one million gallons a day, you were going to desecrate the living entity that is the mountain as well as poison the plants and other, you know, living things that the, the practitioners, you know, uh, basically use. So that case, again, went to the court. Religious Freedom Restoration Act applied because it was federal action. But the court, again, said they basically have the freedom to believe whatever they want to believe. The government isn't coercing anything. It was a repeat of Ling. So the Constitution has not been protective. What does international human rights uh, law add to this? And the provision in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples that I think it is worth looking at is this provision, Article 25, on the spiritual rights. This is the only place in international human rights law where there is a construct of spiritual rights. It doesn't exist anywhere else. Rights to religion exist, but not this except in relationship to indigenous peoples. So indigenous peoples have the right to maintain and strengthen their distinctive spiritual relationship with their traditionally owned or otherwise occupied and used lands, territories, waters, and coastal seas, and other resources, and uphold their responsibilities to future generations in this regard. Does that cover? the lands that we are talking about, even if they're located on federal or state public lands? How many people think yes? It appears to, right? As long as they have that relationship with those lands, they have spiritual rights on those lands. So how would that be evaluated within a domestic framework? And these are the current cases that I'm going to talk to you about in the, in the remaining time. These are the things that concern me. So the impacts of off-reservation activities are tremendously important. Right now, there is an energy infrastructure being built through construction of oil and natural gas pipelines. And it is going to link up, right, the Keystone XL pipeline, which the Obama administration said couldn't go forward, but the Trump administration says can go forward, is the US-Canada. A lot of the energy development is basically by Canadian corporations, and they are putting these pipelines in in Canada, linking up with the United States. That's the Keystone XL. The Dakota Access Pipeline was a domestic pipeline Federal law doesn't govern 
that unless it goes through waters or lands of the United States, the only reason it was an issue in Standing Rock is because it went under Lake Oahe, right? And that was the waters of the United States. You have to consult with federally recognized tribes any time they have interests in the lands that the development is going over. Most of the cases that I'm seeing out there are on state land, and a lot of this land is the ancestral land of Indian nations. They are not going to be consulted about the energy infrastructure that is happening on those lands. Um, there is another um, very important pro project going on in the Pacific Northwest, a proposed liquid natural gas pipeline that's going to hook up to the Ruby Valley Pipeline in Canada. That is going to go through treaty lands that belong to the Klamath and a number of treaty tribes there. Um, and that one is going to be federally permitted. Um, so possibly these cultural interests are going to come to the fore. And my, my concern is that, again, people don't recognize the off-reservation interests that treaties, ancestral connections, aboriginal title, and cultural heritage issues are embedded in those lands and the fish um, are also implicated in the Klamath case. So um, I, I want to, I, I can comment and question and answer about any of these. This is part of my other research on energy. Um, but the, the current debate over public lands, I think the conversation is crystallized in a very important way on the debate over the Bears Ears National Monument. And the Bears Ears National Monument um, is very, um, very important in many ways. So this is in southern Utah, and it's uh, the Obama administration in December 2016 promulgated this national monument under the authority of the Antiquities Act of 1906, which was basically set forth to preserve cultural heritage sites on federal public lands from being looted and, and basically desecrated. So a president has the authority to remove those lands um, for protection. And there are a number of tribes with ancestral affiliations, but there were five tribes that were basically uh, recognized in the legislation or his proclamation um, as having the authority as governments to co-manage this incredibly rich um, resource, cultural heritage resource. So the commission, the tribal commission composed of Navajo, Hopi, Ute, and Zuni um, tribal officials would have the ability to work with the federal agencies, the BLM and Forest Service, on a comprehensive management plan. And that is a self-determination modality. That, that's what they were trying to accomplish. They said that the traditional knowledge in that region was so rich, it was in the, in the rock, um, what they call petroglyphs, but basically there were important clan symbols, shrines marked, origin stories, and an incredible array of sacred places on those lands. So the Obama administration protected 1.3 million acres of the it was a, really a much bigger area. It was like 1.7 that was delineated, but he protected 1.3. The Trump administration downsized that land. It downsized it to a little over 200,000 acres. Little pinpricks in the right and left corner is all that the Trump administration would leave of that. Now, this is in federal court litigation right now. The tribes are litigating, and so are a number of environmental um, organizations. So it's not the end of the story by any means. But what troubles me is that the federal land managers have been told to disregard the protections in the former Bears Ears National Monument. And the tribal commission has been turned into a, a cooperative, I, what are they calling it? I can't get the right word. Cooperative something. So the counties were added, the state governments were added to the tribal commission. So it's just like a big stakeholder kind of management of local government. And that actually destroyed the purpose and intent of that um, proclamation, which was to preserve the tribal knowledge according to tribal 
structures and belief systems in a way that was respectful to those ancestral lands and connections. So we don't know what is going to happen to this. That is Cedar Mesa in an incredibly powerful site for anybody who's ever been there. It just, I, there is nothing that I've ever seen to describe the feeling that you get when you're up there. That site was not protected under this administration's order. And it is very, very troubling. So what about the future? I'm encouraged by the future because we actually have very powerful leaders who are going to be speaking next. And so I, I love the young generation today. And I applaud this generation for its courage in speaking out against the short-sighted policies of federal policymakers and basically operating in a spirit of respect for what is taught by tribal leaders, cultural leaders, political leaders, and ancestors. So I think the challenge of protecting the sacred is multiple, um, but one of the challenges is actually can we even understand in an intercultural sense what is sacred? Is life sacred? Is water sacred? If we call land sacred, how do we know that that land is sacred? Is there anything that basically serves as sort of a guiding post in that? Um, and what are our duties? And that goes back to that whole construct of morality. What are our duties to the sacred, if we can? Um, so the, the, pol the challenge for governments today is to develop intercultural structures for justice. And this is something that I think a lot of people, kind of in the wake of Standing Rock, that was a very powerful moment, right, where indigenous peoples from throughout the hemisphere came together in their capacity as indigenous peoples, but also other people came there in support of the values as intercultural values. Food, water, the air quality, educational systems, health systems, housing systems, all of those are the things that people need to survive. Are we aligned? in our appreciation of the sacred parts of food, water, survival. And if not, where do we go for the values that will guide the future? So one of the things that I think is incredibly important and, and you know, eloquently attested to by, by many of the people who, who you know, were in support of Standing Rock was that idea that that there's a certain mind game going on right now. In consciousness, that's where the battle is, to define what are the parameters of our survival into the future. Think about that land. Think about it crisscrossed with pipelines of oil and gas and uranium that's going up for sale right now. They opened, they're opening that uranium mine that's right on the outside of Bears Ears, and that's going to be increased tenfold over the next 20 years, and the ore is going to be trucked basically right over the Ute Mountain Ute Reservation. The mill is three miles from their elementary school. Those kids, and my, my student put his Oneida Nation, that's the kids, but if you think about Ute Mountain, that's their kids and they're right on the path of the only active uranium mill in the whole country in an era that is going to expedite uranium production. So anybody who's been present with the legacy of that development on public lands and its impact on indigenous peoples should be outraged by that decision, but it just sort of made its way into a little tiny um, part of the news. So these are the, area, the areas that I think that we can all work together in and think together in, and I'm very pleased and honored to have been able to share this with you, and I would love to entertain any questions that you have. So thank you. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, a couple of different tribal sacred sites, um, issues that I've worked on over the years. Um, I, I have been the, um, I am a member of the Grand Traverse Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians. That's an Anishinaabe tribe. 
And uh, part of our traditional homeland is this location here. This is known as Sleeping Bear Dunes. Um, that's uh, Lake Michigan there, you see. Uh, the, the blue part is Lake Michigan. Uh, the white part is, is the dune. And that dune, dune is about 100, 110 feet tall. And if you were on the shore and tried to walk up the side of the dune, it would take you a long time. You'd have to be in extremely good shape. Um, you'd have to be really patient because every step you take um, is lost. The second step, the second step you take, 90% of it is gone. You have to start, it's like walking up an escalator going down extremely fast. Um, and it's one of those things that is part of the, the tribe's tradition. And the Anishinaabe tribes are the Ottawa, Potawatomi, and Chippewa in Indian nations. Um, and this is, a, this is a sacred site. Currently, it's in um, part of the a national lakeshore. So it's a national park. It's protected by the federal government, owned by the federal government. It's part of the ceded territory from the 1836 Treaty uh, of Washington, which the Anishinaabe tribes in Michigan, mostly the Ottawa tribes, were a part of. Um, but there are stories behind, behind, this, uh, behind this dune. There's, there's a, an origin story to this dune. And I think it's worth talking about that origin story. Um, and it's also sacred in some ways um, as a sacred site to Michigan Anishinaabe. So the origin story is this. There were bears in Wisconsin. Wisconsin's on the other side of Lake Michigan. You can't see it from this uh, in this picture. But think west. And uh, Wisconsin is, um, there's, the story is that there was a mother bear and her two cubs. And she was, uh, there was a forest fire in Wisconsin, perhaps, or there was a terrible drought and the bears were not able to um, locate any food. So the mother bear came up with a pretty desperate plan to escape Wisconsin. And the plan consisted of swimming all the way from across Lake Michigan to get to Michigan, which was a much better location than Wisconsin. We're, our tuna brats are not as good as they are in Wisconsin. Neither is our cheese. But we have cherries and apples and wine, so there's that. Um, but they swam and they swam and you know it, Lake Michigan is big it is not exactly swimmable and um, they got close to the end and they were already sort of sick and probably starving even before they got into the water and it was apparent as they reached the point um, on, on the lake where they could see um, Michigan they could see the shoreline that uh, the Cubs were not going to make it and um, the mother tried to get them to go and help them as much as she could but she was also sick and weak and tired and starving. And ultimately, one by one, the cubs uh, cons were consumed by the water and drowned. And if you look carefully way at the top, this isn't a very good picture for this purpose, but those, there's two islands up there. Those are the Manitou Islands. Manitou in the Anishinaabe wind is a word for spirit. And uh, so they're ghosts. These, these islands are very spiritual. Um, they're, they're the representative of the bear cubs. Where the, the cubs drowned is where these two islands came up in their honor. Um, the mother did reach the shore, but when she reached the shore, she was so despondent and devastated and sick and tired, um, she just fell down on the shore and fell asleep. And this is, this is her, this is a representation of her. She is the sleeping bear of Sleeping Bear Dunes. And uh, this is a deeply spiritual and very sad story. Um, but on the other hand, there were stories that grew up around from S S Sleeping Bear. The Anishinaabe people tell lots of stories about the locations they're located in, that they live in. And Sleeping Bear became critically important for purposes of uh, navigable waterways. Lots of Indians used to, to traverse the uh, uh, Lake Michigan and all of the Great Lakes and the rivers as well. And they would navigate by use of the um, uh, landmarks uh, on the shore. I'm the youngest of seven. In 1968, my brother Paul uh, graduated, but my sisters before him had to go on a relocation program. That's, that was still in effect. A policy was still in effect. So we lost my two older sisters going to Oakland, California, marrying and never coming back. So my mother lost two daughters there. Now here was her son. But in 1968, by the federal government policies changing, um, my brother was allowed to stay. So I remember this big old party. We had two parties, graduation and, and there, at that time, Arizona began to open up colleges to allow you to come to school. So now they start looking at the money, okay? Federal, if federal government's gonna help Indian people, Indian kids to go to school, 
well, now, you know, it kind of changes their mind because now they're looking at the value of the, of the student now. So in 1968, it changed. 1974, again, we got some Self-Determination Act. So the tribes, or our tribe, didn't really get a voice till 1982. To 1982, because they had to figure what this was all about, you know? All of a sudden, decisions were placed on them. And that's why when I came, I ended up staying so that we can create under the Constitution that the United States gave us, but also enhance more things in it so that we can really become working towards being self-sufficient. But look at everything else, you hit a ceiling. And, then you, and you feel that ceiling because it, it cannot help your children. It cannot really advance the future in Indian country. So then you have to go back to what was done in, in the 1700s, 1800s, and you find federal policies that were placed. So all this is good that we talk about because I want to go back to two issues. One is Mount Graham uh, in, in Arizona, and the other one's Oak Flats. We had our standing rock already in 1988 when the University of Arizona was exempt from all federal laws. Now, in 1988, what happened was that we went to court in Tucson, federal court, and we won that the United States did not follow the trust responsibility. And then we, so the University of Arizona appealed to the San Francisco, to the Ninth Circuit Court, and we went there, and, and three judges heard, heard the case, and we won again. But little did we not know that the university and all its uh, uh, sponsors on this telescope project, uh, they were already uh, going after an exemption in Congress, already. So when we celebrated and we thought you know, that we, we, we achieved something for the protection of our religion, little did we very know that the very next year, uh, the University of Arizona was exempt from all federal laws. And the whole mound was given to the university, well, the top of the mountain was given to the university with Italy, Germany, France. So I made my trip across um, this foreign country to talk to them to not do this because of what's happening and how it's going to affect our religion. And so the second one came uh, with about four and a half years ago, Oak Flats. They used the same method, exemptions from federal law. And so where I'm from, there's a lot of mining, a lot of copper, gold, silver. So when we looked at the issue, the way the United States has been defeating us has been through exemptions. Then what I found out was that not only were they doing it to us, they were doing it across this country, that a lot of people are not aware of what exemptions are. And probably Native Americans are, because it happens to us quite a bit. And so, so I go to Congress. <clears throat> And I walked the halls of Congress, and so they tell me, Mr. Nosey, you can't talk to this one because, what is that called, atheists? Where they don't have it, they don't believe in a religion? Atheists, right? You can't, uh, you can't talk to this person about the environment because they don't believe in the environment. You can't, and I'm like, is this the United States that we live in? You know, is, this, is this what they sent me to school to learn, that, you know, to support our government, and yet everyone in here disagrees with so many things that, is important to us as American people. And then on top of that, with the University of Arizona and all his collaborators, uh, they would all tell me, talk to the Pope, go to the German parliament, and then with Oak Flats, go to England, go to Australia. <laughs> I'm like, you know, and this is our congressional leaders, our senators, people saying this to us. And it just blows you away, you know. So one of the things that became really important to us is the laws that we face today, the policies. What governs this place? There's a lot of dirtiness that goes under. And then I think back that, wow, there was a lot of great leaders before me that spoke about these stuff, but why didn't they ever fight these issues? You know, we talk about a lot of great German leaders out there. Why didn't they ever fight these issues? And I tell you, it's really hard. Because again, you know, you have to come back to your own place. And I'm lucky enough that I challenge my people that we have to really look at the reality of what federal policies are in place and how it affects us. And we have to make some decisions because those decisions means we're going to have to stand up. If we don't stand up, 
it's going to affect our younger children. And it's going, to ever, it's going to be forgotten because we see the transition. The simulation process is still on its course. It's still happening. So we're going to have to really make some decisions here so that we can look at how we can attack this. But what we got to remember is we're no longer in this fight alone. It's all of the United States in this fight. So the only way we're going to expose what's really evil in this world is go, over, go after these exemptions, because these exemptions identify how Congress can operate within and with outside the law. So it's a really ugly thing that's happening. And um, it's, it's very hard for me to watch TV and, and see all these congressional leaders or like even John McCain be put on pedestals and I'm like, they're the ones destroying America. You know, they're the ones that are doing this. So tribes face issues that the policy may govern because it wasn't exempt, and then there's those tribes who face these issues with no help. So where I'm from, the reason why you don't hear about our issue is because we're exempt. We're exempt. And so when I go around the country finding attorneys, I learned one thing about attorneys, is, and no offense to anybody, but they kind of look at their win and loss column. And if they take on this issue, they're like, the, the land's already been given away, you know. And I'm like, what? But, you know, there's conscience. If somebody really wants to do well in this country and really make a difference, there's, there's, there's a conscience. And what we are doing in this fight right now is going after conscience. We've been at this for over 30 years. And you can imagine how the process has been. It's been slow, but we've been getting there. And, and, you know, I guess if there's anything that's really important that I can tell you is that, you know, there's a frame. And in an American society, we all try to live in the frame. Don't be afraid to step outside of the frame. Because if we begin to step outside of the frame, it's going to only cause it to get bigger. But we cannot fear. We cannot be afraid. We need to start voicing our our opinions and we need to start standing up and then say the truth you know what, what is the really truth here because truth heals for the future for all of our children and so you know I guess I'm really happy you're all here I'm really happy to be here to have the opportunity I mean I, I speak so many places and uh, I'm always praying you know that that people would wake up people would listen and that for whatever reason you're here or where you go and do things that you be guided by that because in this time in place is what's needed. And in ending, I tell people that it's a continuing war because corporations are already setting up themselves. And it was good to hear what you said earlier, not being able to operate the stuff because this is the next war here that technology is going to really guide our children. And that's what's scary. It's because there's no mind here. And corporations, corporations control. And so what I tell people is that we've got to be reminded when enough is enough. But uh, in ending, I just, again, I just want to say thank you. Uh, this is a huge topic. I mean, I, I, I wish you kind of had more time how you could break it out so I could really show you how it works. Uh, but just the fact that just listening and, and, and us being in, in this room together uh, means that, you know, there is hope uh, that by all of us working together, we will reach that point where we'll all will be, will be saving what's left in this world. Because really, that's what's left, is, is we got to save what's left. Other than that, it's all gone. So again, thank you. Thank you for having me here. Thank you. Thank you, Wensler. Our final panelist is Najoni Pike, who is an Apache youth activist and member of the Apache Stronghold. Please join me in welcoming Najoni to the stage. Um, hi, my name is Najoni Pike. I am 17. I'm a junior at, currently a junior at Gulp High School. Um, Winsler's my, Winsler knows he's my grandfather. Um, I know our three other um, panelists talked about um, laws, policies, and, but I want to talk about the future and the sacredness. 
um, Oak Flat and Mount Graham are my homelands. That's where I come from. And my older sister had her sunrise dance at Mount Graham. And a sunrise dance is where um, when a young girl turns into a woman, the transitioning of being a little girl to a woman. Um, she, the woman, the girl, when she starts her menstrual, she in four days has to find godparents who will guide her through this ceremony. But not only that, she will go through, uh, it's a year until she has the big ceremony and goes through transitioning of becoming a woman. On the first day, she wakes up early before the sun does and then she cooks for the medicine man who is gonna do the ceremony and for her godparents. As she wakes up in the morning, she gets out of the wiki up, which is the, a home that she built herself, by herself, and she puts it all together so that she knows how to make a home. And then um, she dances over the food to the medicine man, and then the godparents do it. Then she goes and dance over food for the, her godparents, and then the, godfather, the godparents bring it back. Um, and then on the night, she dances many songs, hours of dancing, and the next day, she, her godmother molds her into a woman, massages her, and then she dances to the sun, um, praying to bear children someday, because it connects with the Mother Earth of the Shem that's what they call her, the Sunrise Girl. And then um, on Saturday night, she dances between the crown dancers, the, which are in our eyes angels to us. Um, she dances between them with a few other girls that have their, had their sunrise dance. She has a partner who has also had her sunrise dance to help her and guide her through her dance. On Sunday morning, she gets painted by her godfather. Her godfather paints her so that she, she becomes the woman um, the white painted woman, which is in our creation stories. And as she, the godmother wipes her eyes after she's gone painted paint in all white, she sees the world not only as, not, not no longer as a little girl, she sees it as a woman. She has a cane and every time she dances, she has to go with the beat of the drums. And what I always prayed during my sunrise dance is that it's waking up Mother Earth, telling her that she's becoming a woman just has, and gonna be a mother someday just as Mother Earth is. And as I, um, as I, when I had my sunrise dance at Oak Flat, that's what I think is, uh, Oak Flat has been sacred and, it's, and been in my family, but I decided to have decide to have it at Oak Flat, not only because it's sacred to my family, but it's because it's sacred to me. Not only to me, but other families and other children in my tribe, and not in just my tribe, other tribes. That is where my great-grandmother came from. You know, it's, and that's where my sister had hers at Mount Graham. And at the sunrise dance, after you had your sunrise dance, knowing that you can bear children, that you can, now you're seeing as a woman, as you can, you know in the back of your mind, if electricity was to go out, I know I can go out and build my own home. I know I can cook for myself. I know where everything is. I can get water, provide for myself. And that's the main thing about this ceremony is that as a, as a Apache woman, you have to know these things. And as an Oak Flat, if I were, if I were stranded somewhere in San, Carl, uh, San Carlos Globe, anywhere, I know I can walk to Oak Flat. And I know I can find acorn, berries, water, anything, and the utensils to live there. And uh, Mount Graham is sacred to me because that is where my great-grandfather came from and my, the Chiricahua people. And as every year we do the sacred run to Mount Graham. And um, when we go to Mount Graham, at the, on the second day when we're there, early in the morning we travel to the very top to um, see the water on the very, very top. And it's very sacred. As my grandfather says all the time, it's like you can't just drive somewhere sacred. You have to feel the struggle. You have to, you have to feel the struggle before you get there. You have to, um, like, no, you can't, it, everything's not so easy. In order to feel that spirit, you have to go through these corridors. And that we always run, and so we run more than 100 miles to Mount Graham every year. 
and that's the struggle. And so you feel the spirit more than ever than just driving there. Or when we mar march to Oak Flat every year, you feel the spirit more. You know the struggle. You go to these certain corridors. And there's a story that my grandfather always talks about how the cardinal, when he came here to, to go to Mount Graham to see if it was holy, and he just got on a plane, got there, drove to Mount Graham, and there for 15 minutes walked around by himself and said, it's not holy. But I believe it's, it is holy because he didn't feel that struggle of what we feel when we run it every year, to go through these certain corridors to feel that spirit. And, it's, and I'm thankful to see all you guys here because, you know, I know that somebody cares that. I believe this place is sacred, or any sick place is sacred, that you guys will go and change these laws that will, that will help us the future and my grandkids so they can see Oak Flat, so they can see Mount Graham. Because there's so many things that are sacred and that are being lost by corporations, but they don't, the only reason why they don't feel the sacredness as I do is because they have that, we as uh, indigenous peoples, we have that um, connection to the land because this is where we are from. This is where, and to know that, um, and they, they just care about money and they, their greed. And so when I think of Oak Flat, I don't want to see it like, I don't want to see it to be just a big um, dent in the earth I want to be able to take my kids there. I want my daughters to be able to have their sunrise dance there, to experience that spirituality as I experienced when I had my dance. And my little sister, because she saw my older sister have her dance at Mount Graham and saw me have my dance at uh, Oak Flat, she decided to have her massage at Oak Flat and have her dance at Mount Graham because there's so much sacredness from these two sites and not just from in Arizona. There's bunch of sacred sites. I've been to Standing Rock, I've been to San Francisco Peaks, I've been I've been to Bear Ears. It's there's so much holiness in this world that are being attacked because of all the resources that are inside of it. So they're attacking these resources that they've used up and because they think res these natural resources are resources are infinite, but they're not. They're going to run out at some point. And then what's, where, what's that going to leave my grandkids? What's that going to leave my great-grandkids? They're not going to be able to see all these things that I see or the things that my grandfather and his and our ancestors have seen because it's um, cities are more, cities are going to be built, more corporations are going to keep digging. and But we need laws to stop that because I want to see Oak Flat. And when I pass away, I want my grandkids to see Oak Flat. When when they pass away, I want their great great grandkids to see Oak Flat. I don't want it to be gone just because somebody didn't see it as holy. But um, I always think back when I'm in my hard times and I close my eyes and I feel that spirit of Oak Flat, or I feel the spirit on Mount Graham. And it's. So crazy that because I'm so far away from home and I'm never really far away from home, and I'm and just knowing that you guys can make a difference, help me and every indigenous person, and not just indigenous, but everybody, whoever thinks something is sacred, that it could be protected, not just um, destroyed by these corporations. But I just want to thank you all for being here. You know, it's, it gives me hope. It gives the future, my the future generations hope. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Just really quick, um, Mount Graham is a sacred mound to the Apache people and, and a lot of the different tribes. And again, the University of Arizona went after the mound and exempt got exemption from all federal laws. And because of uh, Donald Trump in office right now, the university now is contacting many of the other universities about their interest to come back to get more of the mountain. And they want to, on the very top, there's water, holy water that she was talking about. And that, you know, they're after the water, but we're able to keep them away from the water from the very top. So if you think about 11,000 feet, a mound and, and, and a water coming up the very top, I mean, that's how unique. And it's old growth. It's, it's been there since 
time of uh, creation. And so that's, that too is being under attack. So we, we, we're, we're trying to address these issues with the Vatican and with all the uh, churches. And, and again, going back to the University of Arizona, uh, I was arrested by the University of Arizona and I wasn't able to come back to their property until about 20 years later. But I was arrested for praying on top of Mount Graham. Uh, the other thing, uh, the Oak Flat area that uh, Joni was also talking about <coughs> is, a, is a land, again, it was exemptions done for resolution copper and uh, uh, they're gonna, uh, everything's gonna subside, the, the area that she's talking about, and it's right down to the core of the earth where it's gonna be 184 degrees, and that 80, 184 degrees gotta go somewhere, so it's gonna go to the top, and they're saying about a 50 mile radius, uh, the temperature is gonna spread out. And then on top of that, they didn't get the tailing area exempt, so there's a fight right now in Arizona but what's really crazy is the town of, Fe I mean, the city of Phoenix, Mesa, those guys are all sleeping when you're talking about 15 miles uh, of waste that's going to be put uh, near Apache Junction. And so if you look at the area that we're from, it's a high rate of uh, cancer. 60% of people die from cancer. And it, it's become normal to the area of mining people. And so uh, in ending, um, one of the things that we try to tell people to make them understand more clearly is that these sacred places are no different than Mount Sinai. When they talk about Mount Sinai and what it's all about, that's the same thing here. And so what Najoni's talking about is that my mother was exiled out of there. You know, all her people were exiled. And we grew up on the reservation one day wanting to go home. But we're able to keep it within our songs and, and our prayers and just touch it. And, but now that we've left the reservation, like we're talking about federal land, reservation and federal land, we're able to de defy the United States government, because you can only stay on federal land for 13 days, but we've been occupying for over four years. And so uh, we really have raised the issue now, and, and so as Joni tells the rest of the people in Arizona is that if you destroy this place, then how is my kids gonna learn? And the song, I mean, they'll learn the songs and the prayers, but when they wanna go touch this place, it's gone. So how is that fair to our religion versus every, everybody else's religion? And it's unfortunate it's like that, but that's why the great movement has started to begin to uh, make it a national attention. Because from all my years working over 30 years, um, as long as congressional leaders are not being exposed and the American public does not know what's happening, then this is gonna continue. And that's why we have joined forces with the Poor People's Campaign so that it will be a part of the agenda and that will force tribal leadership, force American people to pay attention more so and that so that we can put bills in Congress so that uh, hopefully policies and laws can be uh, created you know, to save what's left. But uh, as I tell people, I don't care how smart you are as a chairman, how good looking you are as a chairman, chairwoman, I said, but you're gonna hit the ceiling. When you hit the ceiling, don't let it be too late because right now you have to be proactive in making things happen. And while we got the attention of America, it's time to use it wisely so that we can all save these places. But it really saddens me when I hear my granddaughter talks about that because you know it's the same thing with like San Francisco Peaks. It's, a, it's like Mount Sinai. And they're, and they're putting urine and all stuff on top of that mountain. And so you know, I know that they, they pressure us to, to show burden of proof. Well, at Oak Flats, just a few weeks ago, we had our holy ground. If you go to the Oak Flat website, you're gonna find that our holy ground was destroyed. And so for the first time, the Tonto National Forest and the FBI are now involved, which means a can of worms just opened because now they identified this place as physically being abused, no different than a church. So we wanna thank our creator for that because we've never gotten any kind of recognition like that. So I'm pretty sure a lot of the tribes and everybody will be banding since uh, you know we've gotten a call from congressional leaders, what can they do? How can they help? Even Elizabeth Warren called me and, and said, what, what can we do to help? So I said, we need to introduce a new bill. So we got that process going right now, but we're gonna need support across America in order to make it happen.